Good morning once again and welcome to another Sunday, early morning Sunday show, Christmas edition. Notice, I do not have an ugly Christmas sweater. Why? I don't own one. You know, I don't own anything really Christmas to wear. I, you know, when I, when I worked in retail, I had a lot of Christmas ties. But I haven't worn a tie in a number of years now since I retired from that. And actually, when you're working over in, um, you know, Puerto Rico and Hawaii, you just didn't wear ties. So, this is it. So, we have Sex Pistols, but there's like Christmas colors and they're red. You know, that's a Christmas color. I've been watching a lot of videos, though, and I've seen these music rooms and that, all the decorations. So, I thought... I need to up my game here. So I did. I put, there we go. See, right there. Can you see that? That's the Three Kings. I put that up. That was a decoration. That's from Puerto Rico. And there's a little snowman. So I thought that really made the place festive. Kind of gave me a little pop and got things looking really nice. So welcome to the first day of winter. This is the first really big official day. It started yesterday. And to celebrate it, we have winter in the background. So... Thank you, Johnny, for helping us bring winter in properly. All right, got some neat stuff we're going to um, go through today. So let's get rolling because I'm going to try and keep this under 20. Yeah, right, I know. Okay, first one. Psychedelic Aliens. Is that just not the best name? The Psychedelic Aliens, the Psycho-African Beat. Okay, how about that? And this group is from Ghana, another one of those, you know, late 60s, early 70s rock group that, 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 that developed in um, Ghana, of all places. So what was happening there in Ghana is, you know, there were some bands, but the bands were like in the hotels or the military had a band. The police, you know, had their own band. But kids had a hard time forming bands because it was so expensive. There was a 300% tariff on instruments. So they couldn't get instruments. It made it very, very difficult. Uh, but these guys were able to get some instruments and formed. And they called themselves, actually, at the start, just the aliens. Because they were from, they had, there were some different, you know, mixed nationalities. They're from Ghana, but you know, some were from had Lebanese in them, some Nigerian. So that's what they did. They sang in French, English, and oh man, there's one other language. So you know, one singer could do French, one singer could do English. Uh, they they produced only eight singles in their time. But they were, you know, they started with that James Brown kind of funk is what they liked. And they had this really groovy organ. I mean, that thing, it, it has funk to it. But then they began hearing more Hendrix. And so they got a wah-wah pedal. And away they went on, you know, trying to sound, you know, more of a Hendrix type guitar and of course the percussion in the background just grooves it drives the beat uh, super amazing you know they have drums but they have the congos going and it's just this drive it is you know it's one of those incredible albums that you just put on you can listen to again and again because there's so much different types of music uh, you know it, it, it you know to get by the government, you know, the government had this 300% tariff on musical instruments. Musical instruments were considered a luxury item. So they began to know different musicians. And when musicians from other countries would come, they would just offer to buy some of their stuff. Like their organ was bought uh, from musicians that, you know, from a different country. And that same with the wah wah pedal and different things. Well, you know, they lasted three, four years, they only had eight singles. You know, they traveled over to uh, Nigeria, big in Nigeria, and of course in Ghana. Uh, eventually, two of the main people left uh, Ghana to pursue, you know, higher education. You know, see, the thing, what, in, in Africa, a lot of these groups, uh, rock and roll was considered, those kind of people were considered to be low lives. You know, they were, you know, they were high school dropouts. You know, they didn't have anything going on, just drugs and sex and stuff. 
And so even, you know, they couldn't get their parents to loan them money for things because they were just thought badly of. So what's interesting in this group is two of them had education and eventually they went to pursue it. So uh, the psychedelic aliens, I, wow, I, it's just one of those poof uh, kind of things. It also came with this neat little book. And Kat, why are you bumping? Why are you head bunting, butting me? Okay, um, I don't know. Cats up to this stuff. So I had this neat book that this came with. Yeah, it just if you could find this African music, so it's the '70s stuff is really incredible. I just picked up something else, but it's newer, and we'll, we'll show that in another in another early morning show. I, I you know. I, I need to do some needle drops. That's what I need to do. So I'll get around to one of them. All right. You know, recently there was Record Store Day. Well, okay, it was a month ago. I'm still trying to show my Record Store Day stuff. But I've listened to, I think I've listened to all of it. Now it's just to get around to showing it. I had like four weeks worth um, of shows. So Collective Soul. I did buy this. At first I wasn't going to. And I, and I didn't pick it up on Record Store Day. It was interesting as I heard some people say, man, they didn't have that Collective Soul uh, where they were at. Nice, nice red vinyl. And my, my little record store in town had like eight of them left over. So I just went back the next day because I did like this album. I like Collective Soul a lot. Uh, another Georgia band, Linda Leg, Go Georgia. They're from Stockbridge, Georgia. And they were, um, the, the singer was Ed, Ed Roland, I believe. Yeah, Ed, Ed, Ed Roland. And he came, uh, actually, he uh, studied at Berkeley College in Boston, the College of Music there. And um, so, you know, he formed this band. Uh, the first, they called themselves at the start, here we go again, we're licking the chin. The first band that they called themselves was called Ed E. That was Ed slash E, Eddie. And then they, uh, but that didn't go, so then they called themselves um, Murky Two Steps. Sorry, it, it, it all escapes me. I, I, I can't remember. Well, but think, things were going tough, and so, you know, they became collective soul. Nothing was really happening, so they made this demo, and um, they gave it. There was a, in Georgia, there was this radio show. It was a college radio show, uh, the Georgia Music Show, I believe it was called. And, and they made this demo, and, and one of the songs was Shine, and it took off. And then it began to go and went into, uh, into Orlando. Well, eventually, record company, and I think it was Atlantic, uh, heard it thought it was great and signed them. Well, you know, the shine was really getting popular. So uh, Atlantic wanted to get something else right away where they really didn't have an album. They just had this uh, record they had made of demos. So that's what they released. This is a demos album. The really official one produced in the studio by other people was the next one that was just, you know, labeled Collective Soul. So, now you can't tell really, you don't think it's a demo, but uh, kind of interesting. And of course then they took off and they had a really good run and some really great hits. All right, next one I want to show, this was from Record Store Day. Getting around to them all, uh, The Violent Femmes, Permanent Vacation. And it is on a cool glass vinyl. So The Violent Femmes started in 1980. And they were considered what you call folk punk. And of course they had, you know, their very first, you know, album came out in 1981. Now, you know, they, they, they were struggling to get found, to get anybody to get any kind of attention. And they were, you know, they just go out and play on street corners. Well, one night they were on a street corner across from the stadium where the Pretenders were playing. And James Honeyman Scott heard them, came over and listened to them, got Chrissy Hine, 
they talked with them, liked what they heard, and these guys went in and they did an acoustic set for that concert. Uh, so it, it, that's you know kind kind of got them started and going. Well, they came out with their you know that first album in 1981, and that had on their "Blister in the Sun" and "Gone Daddy Gone." And when you think of Gnarls Barkley, you know he he did a great version of "Gone Daddy Gone," uh, and you know the first album by far. If there's one Violent Femmes, it's got to be the first album. The other ones I felt, you know, there was some good stuff, but they just weren't as solid as that first one. You know, one of these uh, songs, Give Me the Car. So, uh, give, give Me the Car, uh, the, the, lead, the lead singer on this, he was 18 years old, Gordon Gano, Gordon Gano, boy, oh boy. You know, look at that. Yeah, Gordon Gano. I got it right. Hey, hey. Woohoo. Um, he, he, he was 18. He was writing a lot of these songs. Well, he was part of the, he was in the National Honor Society. And they were having this banquet for the National Honor Society. And so he said, hey, my band will play. So they did. And they played this song called Gimme the Car. And it's really about, Mom, Dad, give me the car because I want to beep, 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 my girlfriend in the back. And, uh... <laughs> He got kicked out of the National Honor Society because of that song. So, little rock and roll history for you, Violent Femmes. Uh, you know, it does have career, you know, variety of different things from the career. But the main focus of this is that first album, which is by far the one you should have. Uh, picked up this. This is Nazareth's second album. I had never seen it until all of a sudden I was in a record store, and there it was. I go, huh, I don't know this one. So I picked it up. The Nazareth started in '68. Uh, they're out, out of Scotland, and uh, you know the name. The name came because they listened to the song. They they heard the band's "The Weight" went down to Nazareth, ba -da -da, ba -ba -ba. and they liked that. They go, "Wow, hey, that's kind of cool." So they named this their name. Their band's named after Nazareth, Pennsylvania, from the song "The Weight." And, uh, you know, again, this was their second album that they came up with. They, uh, this one, they got noticed. And so some people heard them. Actually, Deep Purple heard them, invited them to come on tour with them. So they began to get some recognition. What's we Okay, so I like Nazareth. I have a lot of Nazareth, especially, you know, 70s into the very early 80s. Then I kind of fell off of them. This thing's acoustic. And there's a lot of orchestra in there. I was like, so I listened to it and I go, huh? What? That's not that. Where's Hair of the Dog, man? Where is this flight tonight? Where is that crap? It's really kind of a quiet album. I didn't like it. I have it, and I'm glad because it's an ass that I didn't have. I don't have the first one. I can't really imagine what that is, but this was a, you know, more. It was almost like folksy. It's on AMM Records there. Uh, so I, I was kind of surprised by it. After this, they found the crunchy guitars, and, and then McCafferty really began to start screaming. You know, he retired in 2013 due to health issues, but they're still making music. They've had several lead singers since, but I think there's only one original member left in that band. All right, let's go on to a punk classic, The Undertones. I was so excited to find this. Out in the wilds of West Virginia, I swear to God, West Virginia, you know, for only a few record stores, has some of the best stuff, and this came off Sire. Uh, these guys formed in 1974. Their basis of their band was Small Faces, and a few other bands that were like Small Faces. Then in 76, 77, along came The Clash. And it changed with how they were listening to music and they began to change their style. Now, these guys came out of um, Derry, Northern Ireland, and their music's not political. And you would think during the 70s, coming out of Northern Ireland, they would be all political. You know, I just think of Stiff Little Finger as a prime example of that. But it wasn't. It was just more about growing up, teenage angst and all that. And, and that's what they, they focused on. Well, so the whole punk thing came out. These guys are still trying to get something. Still, nothing's happening. So in 1978, I believe, 
they they came up with I think it was actually 1979 it might have been uh, they 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 did they did the song Teenage Kicks and they made a demo and they sent it to John Peel and John Peel liked it and played it and John Peel liked it so much that he went and he funded an EP for these guys so he made them you know gave them an EP and uh, produced it for them and uh, and the EP began to take off. They, they were playing it. Well, Sire heard it in 1979, and so then they signed them up. So Sire signed these guys in 1979. And they lasted till about 1983. You know, they came up with this. You know, they're on the undertones. There's the backside of it. And by far, this was their big album. You know, again, it had, you know, Teenage Kick Tonight, which to me is one of those classics. You know, it's almost more pub rocky to some extent than straight punk but it, it's, it's a great fun song and if you get any punk compilations usually that's an undertone song you'll see on there all right so let's switch over you know we've been in england a little bit here actually we spent a lot of time over in england we've been in the u.s how about let's go to japan domo arigato mr Rubato. Uh, and uh so yellow magic orchestra here and this is on the beautiful label of Horizon. Huh, I haven't seen that one. Okay, this guy started in 78 and they went to like 1992, broke up, started again in 2002. And they really, these, they, they were pioneers. Yellow Magic Orchestra was pioneers in using like synthesizers and drum machines and sequencing. And they, when, when they started, they were just going to be a one off. Group. We're only going to do one album, and that's it. And their whole their whole goal was to be a disco instrumental group. So they did the song. It's called Computer Games. This is the first song on here, and it became really popular. In fact, the U.S. it sold over four hundred thousand uh, singles were sold on this, and also I think it went to top twenty in the U.K. They also had another song called Firecracker. So suddenly people were clamoring and they wanted this and so they got signed to a record contract to produce more and again these three the three gentlemen there uh and it was sakamoto yukihiro hasano hasono you know i'm saying them wrong you know it uh, they uh, they began producing you know more of this music yeah you know, when you think of the beatles in the 60s the beatles took mercy beat and they made it into a huge thing well they did the same thing with their music and they made techno pop huge over in japan so uh really created a phenomena over there so this is their very first album from yellow magic uh, it was really fun you know i've had a yellow a couple yellow magic but i never had the first one and there it was in the record store, so better pick that up. All right, moving on. Yes, still more record store day. Ah, bless it. How many? I still have more to show, folks. This is the one. Uh, this is a reissue from the Rye Cooter Manuel Galaban. Hopefully, I'm saying that right. And it was called Mambo Sinuendo. Ry Cooter, you know, 1947, he was born. Yeah, in the early 60s, he did a kind of a pickup trio of Bill Monroe and Doc Watson, and he played the, the guitar. I mean, the banjo. He played the banjo in the group. Uh, yeah, then, you know, he... Yeah, I guess he really got noticed when he became playing for Captain Beefheart. And, really? You could hear that, huh? That, to me, wow, that was a lot of noise. But uh, he became, you know, really popular through Captain Beefheart and this guy's played for everything well of course in the late 90s he began you know doing the music for the Cuban and we had the Bueno Vista Social Club and that's where Manuel Galaban comes from you know he's from Cuba and what played on the Bueno Vista Social Club too so these guys did this album together I believe it was in 2003 it was and uh it's just it's uh, 2001 it was it was it was recorded 2001 but in 2003 it won a grammy for best pop instrumental pop instrumental huh uh now manuel galaban he, he passed away he's born in 31 and i think he died in uh 2011 uh there but this is a great testament it's beautiful music it's the cuban 
you know, has a Cuban flag. If you like Buena Vista Social Club, this is a must-have. And is that not from a, you know, a 59 Cadillac? I think it's 59 with the big fence. Just a cool. That, I really like that article. Oh, man. Almost there. All right, a couple pickups. Jimmy, Jimmy McGriff. All right, we got two of Jimmy McGriff's here that I found. I was unfamiliar with Jimmy McGriff, but I saw this one, Red Beans, and I talked last week about, hey, Red Beans, that reminds me of Puerto Rico, because uh, everything's eaten with Red Beans. So McGriff was born in 36, he passed away in 2006, and he's known for hard bop and also for soul jazz, and he was an organist. Uh, both his parents were pianists. And by age five, he'd learned to play the piano, but he also learned to play a variety of other instruments. Well, you know, he went off to Korean War. He was in the military police, and after the Korean War, he became a policeman in Philadelphia. And he was born in Germantown, Pennsylvania. So, you know, he was a policeman, but one of his friends, he had this friend that was really doing well with music, and he was saying, man, you, you, you should do this. You, you should go out and play. And his friend that was playing music was Jimmy Smith, the organist Jimmy Smith. So he was doing all this jazz and different stuff. So he got Fred McGriff to go and start playing. You know, form up, you know, work with some other people and then form his own band. So that's what he did. So step one, this was an album from 1969, and Red Beans is from 1976. And I bet you they have a label on them, too. Shall we just see what's going on with that? And there we go. Solid State. It's kind of a neat little label, isn't it? Um, and this one had... Boy, I feel so disorganized this morning. I think the cat on my lap is throwing me off. Oh. And hey, here we go, here we go, here we go. And this one on Crow Groove Merchant. This is kind of fun labels. So uh, a couple of the albums. Uh, it really is in the vein of soul jazz, I find, on this thing. Right? It, it has a definite soulful feel to it. Uh, it really grooves. The organ's great on there. This one's a little poppy on me. The other one's, you know, pretty, sounds pretty quiet. But I, I really, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of just the organ as the main instrument. I love them in the background and everything, and there's some stuff I really don't much care for as much organ. Uh, some of the psychedelic organ, I kind of go, I guess I just don't take drugs, so I don't get it. Uh, I, I enjoyed those because they were soulful and they were really funky. All right, final album. And this came from Chris from First Pressing Goodness. It was the VCLT that he gave me. Uh, and thank you again, Chris. This was Jazz Skiffle and Drug Style. Drug, <laughs> drug, and Drug Styles. Jug Styles. There could have been Drug Styles with it. And this is music from Chicago from the, like 1925 to 1929. And there's the label on there. Uh, you know, this is one of those albums that you know, I just dig because it's about history. And this looked at the jazz of Chicago uh, back in the late 20s and how there was different things out there. And, you know, the Jug Bands, the Jug Bands started really in Kentucky. They didn't have any money. They couldn't buy instruments, so they had to make their own instruments. And the Jug was one of the things. And you would think that is, hey, I could just pick up a Jug and start going, boom, 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 boom. Well, you know, to play it well, it just takes some practice. And you had to have really good Jugs. Had to have a really good judge. That's what she said. Uh, so they, you know, that was part of what they did. Skiffle bands had banjo on there. Uh, some, and then you know they would have cornets playing. So there's a variety of different groups on here, and so you get these different styles. But it's that 20s. You can hear that roaring 20s sound on here, and it's just a really neat historical record to me to listen to what was going on. You know, I've said it a million times, y'all. You know, I, I buy music, and a lot of times I buy it for history, for to hear what was happening, to get a better understanding of it. I it's, it's part of my enjoyment, and we all have different ways in which we enjoy it. I like to hear something goes, okay, this was happening in that period very nice, so really like that. 
That's my pickups. In the background today, we've been playing Jazz to the World, one of my one billion Christmas CDs. Uh, we got that going on in the background. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, and I, I hope you, every, each and every one of you, have a really Merry Christmas, a Happy Holiday, Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa. Uh, whatever else that you may, you know, celebrate Three Kings Days. Uh, I, I always appreciate you know you tuning in and the comments. You know, you guys really do you know send me a lot of comments and thank you so much for that. You kind of keep me inspired and keep me going, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, I really, really do enjoy that. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Had a lot of new subscribers this week. Again, I want to say thank you for that. I hope you're finding something you're enjoying out of this instead of just finding, hey, he did another mistake. But that's half the fun of it. Let me tell you, <laughs> I'm good at screwing it up. Got to, got to be something. Got to do something well, right? So Merry Christmas to you and your families. Uh, we'll be doing some different videos coming up. I have a best of 2018. I've been told, hey, try and do that. All right, I'm gonna do one of those. It'll be out there, okay? It won't be normal. So uh, let's see what happens. So thank you again. Cat says Merry Christmas too. Uh, he's been a real pain in the ass right now, but it's okay. So appreciate you, everyone. And I did go way over 20 minutes again. My apologies.